You're with California 9, KCAL TV, Norwalk, Los Angeles. Now, Pat Harvey, David Jackson. David Jackson takes you on a journey to Vietnam. David Jackson takes you on a journey. Tonight, how do you build a country from nothing? David Jackson takes you to war-torn Afghanistan. And leaving the nation, we faced a 300-mile drive from Kabul through Jalalabad and on to the Khyber Pass into Pakistan. A lawless, bandit-filled trek where every roadblock can be a life-threatening experience. It is, in fact, so dangerous, I had to travel in Afghan hat and scarves to not draw attention to me or our car. When we were stopped by gunmen, it was up to our exceptional interpreter to convince the people we were not American journalists. Yeah. My friend, thank you. Uh, thank you. And say goodbye to Dave, too. I will. Yeah, thank you for everything. More than 3,000 Southern California families have uprooted and moved to Israel, many of them living near here in the area around Jerusalem. This Gaza Street is being strafed with gunfire as we tried to make our way to an Israeli military checkpoint. Families raced to get out of the way, pulling their children back to safety. 18 people were wounded right in front of us during this exchange. I telephoned the relatives in Nablus to tell them that we could not enter the Palestinian town. They say it's too dangerous for our car, but what the Marines called a suicide turned out to be a carefully concealed murder. The dead body torched in such a way that the fingerprints, footprints, and even facial characteristics were all burned away. Turns out it was a very professional job, and it leaves police with a very puzzling mystery. Like who was killed? The lone survivor of the accident, bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones, is expected to be able to speak with police by the end of the week. His crucial account of what happened is also likely to determine the fate of the seven photographers who were taken in for questioning after the crash occurred. Maureen, here at the department store owned by the father of Dodi Al-Fayed, a clue has been uncovered in the investigation. Maureen, I'm standing here in front of Salpetriere Hospital in Paris, where bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones is continuing his very slow recovery from the tragic accident that happened here 10 days ago. Now, doctors I spoke with today inside the hospital told me that Jones has undergone 10 hours of facial surgery over the past two days to repair broken bones in his head. Well, Maureen, I talked today to a spokeswoman over at the hospital where investigators had tried to get a written statement from injured bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones, but they say that today he's still just a little bit too weak to give them that statement, so according to them, they'll try again within the next 24 hours. We have UN identification that lets us move pretty freely through this part of Bosnia, RD, but it's a lot more difficult for the local residents to do that. The wait has been agonizing for everyone, from a worldwide media contingent to the officers that have been planning the mission. And of course, getting into this area through the air is only half the battle. Turned out I, I ended up in a hotel and actually a, a reasonable accommodation, uh, but uh, upon arriving, that's true, you don't know. a whale researcher. Now to give you some idea what they face over here, some of the researchers from the Free Willy Keiko Foundation have signed on for a period that could range as long as 10 years. And I suspect 10 years out here might feel like 50 to a lot of people, considering the temperature has now dropped down to almost 40 degrees. We're in a driving gale. And remember, <laughs> this is August. And as I mentioned a moment ago, unfortunately, whoa, beg your pardon here, but we're really catching a serious blast of wind and dirt. Just hang with me for one second. Unfortunately, this whole situation not over for the people of Oklahoma City. Pat, I'll tell you what, there are a thousand stories on every street here in New Orleans, and that's what happens when you go through the residential areas. And we saw Lena's pa uh, piece that shows us a lot about what's taking place across the city. And we become accustomed in California a lot of times to not having any of the helicopters operate uh, at night because of the danger of the lay of the land, the way the hills are, and you can't see them. Of course, here it is totally flat, and the helicopters do operate at night, so we've had a number of them going overhead this evening. Well, I think we probably can be optimistic because, as you might be able to hear behind me, uh, helicopters continue.
continue to roar over the capital city as more and more troops funnel into this town. And that is good news because that just means that more order can be maintained. There can be more control. Now it's down to 475,000. That's still a lot of money as the transfer rate goes between the U.S. dollar and the Somali shilling. So you have to carry around big giant amounts of uh, their cash like this in order to buy anything in the country. The disaster in El Salvador is on a spectacular scale. Literally hundreds of thousands of buildings have been destroyed. They told us this was a devastated town. Now you get a pretty close idea at exactly what that means. That means almost every structure and every building here is down or will have to be torn down after this. It really feels like every week or every month there's another peaceful breakthrough to report from this part of the Middle East, whether it's between Jordan and Israel or Israel's other neighbors like Syria and the ongoing discussions with the return of the Golan Heights. I'm on the catwalk up here, 750 feet up. We wanted to show you this picture looking back toward Chrissy Field, back toward San Francisco. I think you have a view of Alcatraz. But in this kind of wind on a bridge that is, in effect, rubber because it moves back and forth when you get into these 50-mile-an-hour gales, it's it's a precarious place. I have a safety line here, but for some reason, that's just not enough. We wanted to show it to you real fast. Reporting live from the South Tower, I'm David Jackson. Now, Andon Ross, back to you. David, you are one brave gentleman. I tell you, I couldn't Solid get up there. Solid concrete here. I yeah, like it. Yeah, we like it right here on home base. So you've done everything you can to prepare for that day. You look out the window. You see smoke. The fire's coming directly at you. What do you do? Well, Gay Yee joins us now with some property-saving and life-saving advice. Survival. It's your first instinct in a fire, but why wait for a fire to prepare for one? Up next, what you can do to save your home and your life. I'm up here on top of the mountain uh, where this fire began, or close to where it began. It came up over the hill here, and as you can see, the wind blowing very hard. The higher the elevation you are up here, the more the wind is blowing. This house and uh, area behind me, of course, clearly completely taken out by flames, and we're hoping at this point that there's no gasoline left in the car that you see right here. I don't think that there is. They missed us by not much, and here comes one again. Ron, take a look. It's coming right at us. Yeah, we'll have to hope we get missed here. You still there, David? We're, we're about <laughs> 20 feet to the left of these drops, so, uh, so far we've been all right. Cameraman J.R. Hall and I were among the very first outsiders to enter the scene of this long and bloody siege. Well, you can see how it could have held 123 people without too much difficulty, but uh, for up to 40 days and 40 nights. And tonight at 11 o'clock, we will show you a lot more from inside the Church of the Nativity, that look that we got right after all those prisoners were released late this afternoon. David, some are saying that it's virtually a miracle that even more damage was not done to the Church of the Nativity, the 39 days, the confusion and chaos, the number of people who occupied it. What's your view in Israel? I think it is something of a miracle. That's true, Laura. That's what it feels like when you go inside that church. Because when you take a look in there and see just how much there was to potentially destroy, I mean, even if you weren't careful inside that church, there, there, it's just, it's packed full of artifacts in uh, every direction that you look. Uh, it is something of a miracle that that did not happen. Uh, clearly, somebody tried to steer clear of doing any real damage in there. Nevertheless, it looks upside down simply because those people were living in there for such a period of time. But according to the monks and the priests that we talked to inside the church, they think they'll be able to clean that up, get everything taken care of over a short period of time. They think they'll be ready. By Sunday morning, they are anxious to begin services once again. Live in Jerusalem, I'm David Jackson. David, Laura, back to you. Well, Ellen, life is slowly coming back together here. We've sort of uh, updated everybody each night almost on the ongoing drama over the electricity. It's been up and down and up and down. Right now it is up, and we certainly hope that it stays that way, but it probably won't. Safir Caleb said to me he has four children. He has no income. He has no money. He has no idea when he will have money or income. And he said, really, he is to the point of desperation. So if you think the problems here are over, they certainly are not. Many people uh, like him are going to face a very difficult couple of months ahead. We'll have more tomorrow night on Eyewitness News. Live in Baghdad, David Jackson, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Now back to you. Well, David, that's right. At first, the apartment buildings that you see behind me just had a trickle of people returning back home. That's only been over the past couple of days. These are really permanent housing units, a lot of them right here, that you see right next to the disaster site itself. It took a big antenna to pick up those first flickering images from the moon, and fortunately, we had one right here in Southern California. 
JPL's immense Goldstone antenna base had all of its big dishes trained directly on the Eagle lunar lander and provided the video and the sound for the one billion viewers that were watching that day here on Earth. We are right now at the absolute peak of this storm at 4.30 in the morning. And as you can see behind me, this Exxon gas station is not faring terribly well. I had to drag everything that was dry from my own room when the wind and water came smashing through the walls. And everybody in this particular motel felt the same thing. At about 4 o'clock in the morning, they say it was like an explosion. All of a sudden, gusts of wind hitting the building from this side, taking the roof off, blowing out all the glass, shutting everything down inside the motel. All of a sudden, everything went black. It was as though the world for these people, they say, came to an end in a matter of a split second. And the wheels are already turning at NASA because the shuttle Atlantis is already being prepared for a launch that they would like to get underway by mid-November at the Kennedy Space Center. That, land, that uh, shuttlecraft is being worked on right now at the Kennedy Space Center. And they're also, of course, working on the replacement craft that will eventually be the replacement for the Challenger. So a lot of work going on and a very successful mission that everyone here, of course, is very happy about. Reporting live from Southern California, I'm David Jackson. Earlier there were showers, then it uh, cleared up again. It got cloudy again. Now it's clear, so you don't know. It's changeable weather pattern. I think probably what it'll come down to though the key factor today might end up being the winds right now they're uh, fairly gusty and they're coming out of the east and the winds have to be below 14 knots on the ground and they also have to be fairly low in the upper altitude for the launch to be cleared so we may have to wait right up until the last minute and the launch is of course scheduled for 1 48 p.m. our time about an hour and 45 minutes from right now we'll be standing by to see what happens guess who knows more about the weather than either you or I David Jackson he's in it, he's in it. I have some idea of the weather out here. It is kind of, I'll have Carl clarify, but kind of sticky almost uh, out here a little bit, Carl. Kind of damp and sticky. I don't know if it's a high humidity or what it is, but uh, cooling off fast and really kind of thick. The air's kind of thick. Uh, what do you call that? Well, uh, you've got a little bit of a marine layer coming in, David, but I'm just yeah. curious about the hair that's flying around. Is there a strong wind or are you just not having <laughs> enough hairspray on? As you, as you know, of course, I have a chronic hair problem. And <laughs> Actually, this. David, that's the first time I've ever noticed an imperfection in your hair. Well, it can happen when you're outside. Yeah, it's actually not very windy. It's just uh, just a just light breeze out here. A, not a sticky enough light breeze, but a breeze. Not All much right. wind. We've got some problems out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David. Do we really, David? Perhaps yes, we you do. Tell me what they yes, are. Yes, we do. Uh, we have fog warnings. Or uh, what are they called? <laughs> no, keep going. You're doing good so far. No, they're, they're called. They're they called. Uh, 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 what are I they like called? that. Era. Fog what? Oh boy, your head's in a fog. That's I, fog my head advisory. Is not in a fog. There is fog out there. Dense fog advisory. In other words, be careful out there during the overnight hours and during the morning hours. <laughs> Who's in a fog? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're in control. I was right. This tur turned out to be true. Patricia, just one uppercut, please. No. Have you been drinking coffee tonight? Uh, no. Okay. Iced tea. Decaffeinated. <laughs> Yeah, the decaf from a couple of restaurants that I know. Now. <laughs> well, let's take a look at what's happening outside right now. Well, I'll get uh, some paper and a pencil to take notes. Tonight's Best Buys will give you some gift ideas. <laughs> 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 now, why did you do that? I had to do that. I was crying for that. There are some ideas for the holidays already. Money Man Alan Mendelson found a discounter of tabletop and giftware. And this is in Torrance. David Jackson now with a look at these ultimate fans. David. Well, Pat, it is definitely a scene there. I went to Detroit last weekend to get a close look at this new sport on a night when the state of Michigan tried, I say tried, to stop the fighters from hitting with their fists. It was a long, hot, and sweaty night, but no one went home early. It was thought that the Michigan judge's ruling that banned clenched fist punching along with headbutting might strip this event of, well, of what the crowd came to see. But if you talk to tonight's organizer of all of this, he'll tell you that's not the case. Well, Joe Frazier says in a match between an ultimate fighter and Mike Tyson, he thinks that Mike Tyson would win that fight. He caught me when I wasn't looking right there. But uh, Joe is uh, willing to admit that there are people involved in ultimate fighting that are very skilled fighters. Uh, he just uh, has to side with his sport, which of course is prize fighting and boxing. Pat, back to you. That is where Eyewitness News reporter David Jackson is live with the latest. David? 
Well, Laura and Harold, many people here in Colorado are just beginning to realize how bad this tragedy was today. I was actually told that over the past couple hours by at least half a dozen families who said it's taken them this long to really come to terms with the level of horror that took place inside this high school today. I also spoke a little bit earlier with some representatives from law enforcement who actually were inside the building and they said they hesitate ever to speak about exactly what they saw as they went through the cafeteria and as they went through the library inside the school. Right now, standing at Sunday, they are saying could be 2,000 Marines that will attempt a landing on the beach in northern Saudi Arabia along the Gulf uh, in a position that could be threateningly close to Kuwait. We don't know that exact position. The Marines aren't going to tell us. In fact, they haven't confirmed that that exercise will take place. But the Iraqis, of course, are not happy about even word that it might. Now, as I mentioned, we spent three weeks in Saudi Arabia. We have a lot more material to bring people from inside Saudi Arabia, including tonight, when we take a look at some of the military maneuvers that are still underway in northeastern Saudi Arabia, where we spent that time. The Americans are on the move, and the British are on the move. Of course, this little test run against the French has been for more than just fun. It's provided Black Dollar and his crew with a lot of information. For one thing, they're learning how to handle the heavy, choppy seas out here in the Indian Ocean. And along with that, they're learning how to maneuver one of the most radically designed boats in the America's Cup fleet. They have, in effect, two rudders, one up front and one behind. And maintaining a steady line takes almost constant adjustment. When this mobile home park behind me had the fire up on the hills around it, the firemen in large numbers, firefighters were already down along the streets as you see them down here below. They were trying to put out every conceivable hot spot that they could deal with. It looked at one time as though this fire was going to pass right over top of this mobile park, and we talked about that earlier. Law enforcement officers are only rarely speaking to reporters outside of formal press conferences. But I got a chance today to speak with a Texas state trooper who yesterday drove a Branch Davidian survivor out of the compound. A survivor who spoke to him at length about what happened inside. It is believed that it, uh, it could have been that the children involved, some 17 children in there, may have been poisoned ahead of time or in some way um, knocked out so that they were not aware of the fire when that fire erupted. At least that's been speculated upon by some of the federal agents out here. And we'll find out certainly tomorrow as they begin to go through what is left of the Branch Davidian compound. One reason that work like this can go on for 15 years is because old American artillery shells like these are still being discovered buried underground in rural Vietnamese villages. The villagers are given a small amount of money for delivering these to a central government clearinghouse location. They're then sent here to the steel mill to be smelted down and turned into building materials. We've seen the eye of the storm still sitting offshore, about 85 miles offshore off Vermilion Bay and just to the south west actually of where I am here in Baton Rouge and uh, we expect things to certainly get worse as the hours continue to uh, go by here but the rain beginning to pick up a little bit. The lone survivor of the accident, bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones, is expected to be able to speak with police by the end of the week. His crucial account of what happened is also likely to determine the fate of the seven photographers who were taken in for questioning after the crash occurred. A total of 727 wellheads were ignited. They burned for about eight months and the total loss was about about two billion barrels of oil. That's about a four-year supply of Kuwait's oil at current production levels. But it's only 2% of Kuwait's total oil reserves. If you're familiar with Big Bear, this is the road that goes through the small downtown area here. And they've done their best to try to keep it clear. We have heard snow plows running down on the main uh, road that runs up into Big Bear. So presumably all night long, they've been doing the best they can. We're going to take a close look at that between now and 6.30 this morning when we'll be able to bring you a full account of just how easy or how difficult it'll be for people to come up here if, in fact, those are your plans. But the snow is coming, and it is coming hard, and everybody is very happy. Live at Big Bear, except for me. David Jackson, <laughs> ABC7 Eyewitness News. Back to you. Hey, David. Reporter David Jackson in Big Bear. Good morning, David. Good morning. I wanted to personally thank both of you for your clothing suggestions of an hour ago at 5.30. <laughs> I, I didn't know you could be this comfortable out in the snow, and I am completely comfortable at this point. But it's really a lot of snow coming down, and they are going to have a lot of water content, too, because this is a, a heavy, damp snow, and it's really exactly what they needed up here. And uh, these goggles are exactly what I needed, by the way, and I wanted to thank you once again for your outstanding suggestion. The technology behind these, you know, is remarkable. I didn't realize they were this comfortable. 
And this nice, I could stand out here all day long. <laughs> well, you know what? We, we might just have... This is the Valley of the Kings, one of the traditional burial sites for Egypt's ancient pharaohs. Now, by the early 20th century, when Howard Carter arrived here to begin his archaeological digs, more than 60 of the ancient tombs had already been recognized and identified by archaeologists. And each and every one of them had already been plundered. Years of digging had turned up nothing, and by the early 1920s, Lord Carnarvon had had enough. He told Howard Carter the dig was off and that he would be spending his last season here in the Valley of the Kings. But Carter was desperate. He wanted at least one more shot at finding King Tut. So he traveled from here in Egypt all the way up to England by ship in order to speak with Lord Carnarvon directly. He begged for one more year of digging, and Carnarvon finally relented. Take a look at this as you go into the actual tomb itself. You can see every chip mark still in here, every swing of the blade as they cut through the rock. I mentioned 100 feet back into the mountain itself. Let's climb down through here, a passageway designed to be too small for a fully grown tall individual. Even Dr. Hawass has been shocked by what was found inside this tomb. I never thought that a beautiful scene like this yeah. of the wet nurse of Tut Ankh Amun to show the king this is a unique scene that you have never seen it in any place at all. This is a closed tomb. The public will never be allowed inside. And you too will then be captivated by the lure of King Tut. Go outside, look at their eyes. It's shining, their heart trembling. It will make every individual in Los Angeles to remember the time when we took his girlfriend. He remember if he was holding her hand, if he was looking at the golden mask right. and looking at King Tut and his wife. That is really something that captured our hearts. That is the most important discovery. And this is why I say King Tut is back. King Tut is back. There is a majesty and an aura around a huge passenger ship. They feel alive and exude a personality unlike any other form of transportation. That's why passions run so deep when it comes to the world's liners, from the classics to the modern giants to the boutique ships that cater to a small but discriminating clientele, ships that can often go places none of the others can navigate. Global Passenger Ships is a multimedia experience that brings all these vessels to life, all of them will be part of Global Passenger Ships, a world of entertainment will be located just a computer click away. As you pass through the Panama Canal on a cruise ship, or even if you take a, an eco-tour that goes through the jungles of Panama to be able to get inside the country, there's a good chance that you won't see what we're going to call here the real Panama, a particularly beautiful part of this river. Deep and clear, cool water, very nice. This is You could jump in and swim right here, even though technically you're not allowed to do that. But we're below that British Dam, and then of course just above that, not very far, the Aswan High Dam, built by the Soviets in 1971. It's spectacular. That's what makes Aswan more spectacular than a lot of the areas along the Nile, because you have these more or less sand cliffs that come right to the waterfront itself. Great day. It's a beautiful day. Because David was born on this day. My, oh my. Happy birthday, David. You know, I look forward to this every year. <laughs> you do? You look you forward do, to his huh? birthday? Why? I revel. Oh, that certainly seems <laughs> Oh, because you're, you're, because you're... <laughs> Thank you, Pat. <laughs> you know you're See, welcome. I was born in 1965, DJ. so that makes me 31. Oh. <laughs> Boy, you know, that's I want that to get out of the way of the lightning. <laughs> but you know what? That's some of that fancy new math they taught back in the mid-70s and so, but, so oh, that's okay. I'll buy that. Pat will buy that. Pat has good reason to buy that. I'm a week behind you. <laughs> right. Right? That's exactly why. Wow. For exactly? You know we're a week apart. One week apart. Wow. We are one week apart. Well, my number of years, too, but we won't go into that.
David Kelly. If you saw today's stock market rally, you might be thinking about investing yourself. <laughs> Happy birthday, DJ.